took it out at like 10 o'clock last night and I was like, yes, let's do this. And then, you know, four hours later, I'm like, shit, I should go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, is awesome. No, it's, it's great. We uh, we have a, well, the reason we're up early in the morning, 6 a.m. Pacific time, my time, 9 a.m. their time, is because our guest this week is joining us from Hamburg, Germany. Uh, say hello to the CEO of Rockfish Games, Michael Schade. Did I say it right? Absolutely correct. Good yes! morning, San Francisco and the rest of the world. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We're here to talk about Everspace, but before that, uh, I want to... I wanna, you did a game before this that I really liked. We're going to talk about that. Galaxy on Fire 2 with Fish, is, with fish yeah, Lab games. Yeah, yeah. And so you guys, it's mostly the same people, right, doing doing this one? Doing, doing yeah, it's pretty, much, it's pretty much the same team. We have been working together for about 10 years now on space games. Right. So I, I have, I got to get this off my chest. I have a beef with you guys, okay? okay. I loved Galaxy on Fire 2. It was the best free spa, free freelancer-type game since Freelancer. I'm just throwing that out because I really dug it. So when I finished it, I finished the campaign. And I kept playing a while, and I was like, is there more to this? And I found out, oh, look, there are expansions. Wait a minute. They're mobile only. Yeah, I'm not on PC. I know. What, what, I just <clears> want to <throat> ask why. Why did they never come to the PC? Because I wanted more. That's yeah, a good I thing. I wanted more <laughs> because that was – guys, if you guys haven't played Galaxy on Fire 2 HD on the PC, it yeah. is really a lot of fun. Uh, it's on Steam right now for 20 bucks. It goes on sale often, too. It's on bundles. It goes on sale quite a bit. Uh, so get that game. But now that I've said that, why didn't the expansions ever come out for the PC? I just wanted to get that out there. Why? Yeah. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> I know. A lot of people are actually hating us for that, and I, we can fully understand I don't hate. I was just, I'm just sad. I don't, I'm not hating. Yeah. I'm just sad. So I just wanted to, I'm <laughs> right. just wondering right. why. No, the, the reason is back then at Fish Labs, um, obviously we were a mobile studio, and the whole market turned to free-to-play. And uh, we we had investors Ooh. breathing down our neck, um, move from premium to free to play. So, oh. and then they said, "Well, we don't make much money with a PC version, and uh, why? So, don't spend time, don't spend money on this. We really need to get free to play nailed." And um, actually, they said, "You won't get any money from us if you don't do free to play." Oh my God. Yes, and um, so back then we had the team that's currently working at Rockfish. We would, so we, we started with doing premium games. We wanted to bring console game experience to the mobile devices. And I think we did that to a certain extent. And uh, I mean, yeah. a lot of people loved what we did. Yeah. And then the market changed. And I mean, to a certain degree, the, the investors were right because the market did change towards free-to-play on mobile. And there was hardly... Uh, a way to make uh, enough money with premium games on mobile anymore. So it's like, well, what do you do? And um, so we built a second team. Um, we hired guys who did free-to-play on browser games here in, in Hamburg. So there are a lot of studios very successful in doing free-to-play on browser. And um, yeah, so we tried to do free-to-play. So this is why pretty much everything that was premium uh, back in the days was uh, put on hold. Oh. Yeah, so this is also an explanation why we have a new studio now, because we, like the <laughs> core, is excited about paid games. So pay once, play forever, yes. that's it. And Thank if, you. We have, if we have more content, I think that's fair to ask for money, but not for the game itself um, continuously. Like you, we won't nickel and dime anybody. It's the classic style, and that's how we like it, and we think that's how our fans like it. See, it's interesting. So, that, so you're not making oh. this for free? <laughs> no, I, sorry. I want the yeah. game for free, and, yeah, and I, want it so, I want it yeah. so free that you play it for me. Just make everything a quick time event where you tell me which button to push. Um, yeah. No, it's it, it's interesting. I think you can see it's kind of the dichotomy of that of like the kind of audience that wants everything free, plus, plus and the, there's still an audience that doesn't mind. Like you see this with the new Elite Dangerous expansion. Like, right. you have all these people, and they're like, why do I have to pay for this shit? And then you have people like me, they're like, back in the day, you'd pl you'd buy a game at 60 bucks, and then, like, six months later, an expansion came out for 30 bucks, and you <laughs> didn't mind that so much. Yeah. So, I don't mind that now. <laughs> so, Good. Good. Yeah. No, and we hope you're not alone. <laughs> no, I don't think I am. There are other people who are like, you know what, this, this takes money. It takes money to make this shit, people, so I don't mind, you know. <laughs> I don't mind paying so, paying for for that, you know. 
let's let's talk about the elephant in the room real quick though about this game. This game? Uh, cuz I'm looking at yes, cuz I am looking at the Kickstarter page for this game and there's a bunch <laughs> of gifs on it that are amazing. Uh-huh. And uh there's a section called Eye and Ear Candy and I just want I just I think we should just really get this out of the way. This game looks gorgeous. It does. It does. It like does. absolutely gorgeous. There's there's a gif on the Kickstarter page of like the spaceship doing like a like a Gundam wing kind of a thing where you're just shooting bolts of like purple lasers everywhere <laughs> and yeah. it looks fantastic. Like it I really cannot does. wait to get my hands on this. It really <laughs> does. It's a beautiful game. So let's talk now that we've gotten that out of the way, I feel better. It sounds like you guys were just forced into a bad situation with the Galaxy of Fire stuff and, and Yeah, but uh, well wait, I I wanna I wanna ask about that though. Oh, okay. So so, so the whole the shift in the market with mm-hmm. the, you know where, where People were making premium titles, and then suddenly, the, you know, the wind changed, and, and they say, "Okay, there's nothing but free to play anymore because that's that's all that people are are gonna be interested in, right?" So, yeah. so we have to lure them in the door for free, and then uh, with Galaxy on Fire, like, what what was the freemium content? Was it just like, okay, I've exhausted the content that's in the base game, now I want more, and I pay um, for it, or what? No, it was we had the core game, and then there were two DLCs. And mm. um, back in the days, Apple approached us and say, "Hey guys, what about you get the free app of the week?" I mean, what do you say if you get the free app of the week globally? And of course, you do that. And uh, what we did, um, we put the game that initially cost ten bucks, we put it to free. And the only thing that we were selling was like DLCs. You could own your uh, own space station if you collect um, your forty-something spaceships. And um, we had the in-game credits that you can get by killing pirates and stuff and doing missions. You could buy some of those, but we didn't have like the soft and hardware currency thing that you have seen in other free-to-play games, which means um, we didn't monetize as um, like the, the popular or the successful free-to-play titles did. So it was a lot mm. of we, we generated a lot of downloads and um, got lots of fans, but. At the end of the day, it's like if if you have that for free and um, if if there's no monetization scheme in there, you don't make uh, enough money. So to a certain degree, it was like what our investors demanded, come up with a proper free-to-play game that's really designed to make uh, make money um, on in-game credits, speed-ups, all the typical free-to-play things. That is something that we tried with a different title then. However, because, it, it, because that yeah. puts you more into like an MMO sort of progression, yeah. even in a single yeah. player game. True. So, True. so that that's a thing that fundamentally I would think has to go clear back to the beginning of the design, and and you have to say, okay, we're gonna. I think uh, Skype freaked out. <laughs> Skype yeah. went weird there. I'm still um, here. All good. <laughs> okay. Um, but you have to go like clear to the beginning of the design and design the game that okay this is going to be free to play because all the mechanisms in here need to need to like pull money out of people's pockets right um because in a in a case like this where you have a you have a complete game that's well balanced and and just works and then you try to to kind of shoehorn free to play into there Mm. um then you you know i guess you guys from what you said it sounds like you know that's what your experience was is you know, people get the game for free and and play that, and then we get a small number of adopters that actually pick up the f- the premium content. Um, yeah. But it's a lot less than what your number of downloads is, right? So, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And so, you, you you cannot turn uh, a game that has been marketed as a premium game into a free to play game because obviously then everybody hates you who who paid for the game, and that's I mean obviously for a reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, and th- that's why we came up with Galaxy and Fire Alliances, the free-to-play strategy MMO, right? So that was our attempt to enter the free-to-play which, market back in the days with Fish Labs. Which I was also sad never made it to the PC because that looked awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm just looking at like the PC is kind of the last refuge of of uh, premium titles, right? Yeah, so, and console. Well, yeah, I'd say on well, console as well. Yeah. 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 Very, very true on console as well. Yeah. People so, don't mind paying for console games. Yeah, yeah but, uh, so there you go. Well, that's that's why just, we moved on. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I just well, good see like for you. The, the shift in <laughs> the shift in the PC market, right? Because we see a lot of this freemium stuff coming to PC now. Like if you you know you go to Steam and you just look at like free games and you'll have like a hundred different screens of all this free stuff that's coming out. And I and I just wonder like 
with all of that getting shoveled into the market, does it make it hard? Well, I, I know it makes it hard, but to, like, to, to what degree in your perception does it make it more difficult as a premium developer to actually get noticed? Uh, you know, it's like if, if I have your game that I'm going to pay $20 or 10 you know, whatever your price point is, versus, well, I, I can dip my toe in this other game for free. You know, yeah, it, it's like, yeah. does it make, does that, is that something that you, you kind of resent? You know, it's yeah. like. It's, it's, it's a good question, absolutely. But you could also see it the other way around. If it kind of, in quotes, everybody does free to play now on PC on or more and more. We stand out even more because we're sticking to premium, right? And um, so far, we just um, added to the F uh, FAQ section on our Kickstarter page. Somebody asked if there would be microtransactions in the game, and we said, nope, it's play once play forever and people love us for that so oh, yeah people people don't know what to do if there's no micro <laughs> and, no, I, I, and, I just think and you guys don't... doesn't like to be nickel and dime that's it i mean yeah. at least our audience so before you guys release can i buy the spaceships for you know, yeah, oh, god, oh god oh god oh god oh god oh god that's a reference but, you know yeah to, yeah uh, to, so, to, uh, to a cup to a couple of games now I, uh, yeah. anyway so Everspace. Uh, this is very exciting because we were talking about this a little bit beforehand. It's a space shooter roguelike. And we here on the Space Game Junkie podcast love roguelikes. I mean, love. <laughs> Except for FTL, which Brian can't stand. To well, play. I don't hate it's FTL. Stand. It's just it gives no, me. No, FTL a, it, hates you. It really does hate me. And <laughs> it gives me horrible anxiety. That's why I can't play it. Uh but other roguelikes, not so much. So when 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 I saw that you were doing a roguelike space shooter, I was like, oh, that's very exciting. So you were saying that like you guys were split on the whole roguelike thing. So let's get into that. So how did the the idea of doing a like first slash third person roguelike shooter come about? Um, yeah, as I just uh, pointed out, it's it's our team was pretty pretty much split half and half. So some of our guys really love roguelike. They speed, they played Rogue Legacy, Binding of the Isaac, all those great roguelike titles. And the other half was more more like, hmm, I don't know, constantly dying, start from scratch. Seriously, isn't that kind of frustrating? And um, and me in particular, I was concerned about alienating uh, our fan base, Galaxy and Fire, because there was like you could have you had an um, auto save, you had save slots, your progression was saved, um, you had a storyline, everything. So I'd say everything that you don't find in a roguelike. And uh, but our team was uh, some of our team members were really very strong and said, "No, this is great, and if you played it, then you you get it." And I was like, "Ah, no, I don't know." And our creative director wasn't so crazy about it either. Mm -hmm. So he said, "Now I want to have a story and great characters and such." And you know what? Um, I changed my mind after playing Shadow of Mordor, and I have to say, I really suck at the game. I love it. It looks gorgeous, and uh, like the whole, like the whole Lord of the Rings setting and 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 the, um, the production values and everything. And I died so much. Um, but every time I die, I get some credits, and eventually I can use those credits, get more Ooh. skills, abilities, and then I kick can kick some butt, right? Oh. And I have my revenge, and I kill that orc. And I said, Ah, this is how roguelike works. So yes, if if I suck, well, it takes a little bit longer, but I die, I die, I die, and then I get more points, I get better, and then I have my revenge. And they also have a very nice way to present their story. So I went back to the team and said, now I know what you mean. I get it. But do me a favor. First, because of our fan base, but also as a personal preference, I want to have some sort of progression. Don't take everything away from me. Don't make it so unforgiving. Like, um, I need, it needs to feel good. Like, dying needs to feel, oh, I achieved something. Okay, I died. That sucks. But at the same time, I have something new, right? I have a right. motivation to come back. And then, they came, then we came up with this, okay, you can keep your your big upgrades, if you have a new engine, if you have a new set of wings, those kind of things, we won't take that away from you because you, re you worked really hard for that right. to get it. And the next time you're out in space, you will have an easier life. And mm -hmm. then on top of that, we said, well, if we want to have a story, how can we tell a story in a roguelike where you have to die a lot and other than Shadow of Mordor, you always start at the same point. So we had to come up with something. That's what that I fits. wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask yeah. how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to spoil too much. Let's put it this way. Dying 
your death and the death of other characters in the game, the whole story is about dying and coming back. And um, so you will encounter other um, other characters and there will be fights. And of course, you, ne you need to w win those fights. If you lose, still you have something that you can take with you from that fight. You, there will be story bits told every time you die or another important character for the story dies. Right. And since this is a roguelike, we don't know when and where you meet those characters because every time you start, we roll the dice and we don't know what's happened next, right? So mm. we have to come up with something that works with like projections into the future story-wise, but also things that happened in the past. And sooner or later, you, f you find all those pieces of the puzzle that fits together and then everything... Um, is, uh, is part of a greater event at the end of your journey. And the more you play, the more you understand, ah, who am I? Why I am doing this, right? And um, so that keeps you motivated, not only in terms of like having constant challenge of the rook mechanics, but also the story you get a little bit more every now and then. And, and plus, if you meet side characters, since this is a roguelike, you can decide I talk to this guy, I do the mission for him, I start shooting at him, I rather kill him and try to get his loot. Well, obviously, if you kill him, he's gone. And the story is gone. You will never know what this guy was about to tell you. Oh. So, you, so it's really your decision. What do you do with those characters? Am I killing my quest guy, so to speak, or not? You just kill him. But then the, que then, then the quest is lost. But maybe he has super cool loot, but you don't know that. Oh. Yeah, did, since you played Shadow of Mordor, because they, they have that whole promotion system in with the enemies, where yeah. if, if you go and you kill one guy, then the, the underlings get promoted up, and you know, and if somebody kills you, then they get more powerful. So right. do you have anything like that in play? Because that would be very interesting to see come into a space game, like maybe if they were like pirates or something. And yeah, because yeah. space yeah. game is the one. Space games do not usually have like named like a lot of the bad guys you fight in space games are just generic pirates or generic fanatics. You know, you usually don't have an ace or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like for once to have somebody that I see their name and I avoid them because I know that I'm not. It's like, oh shit, to get it's that guy. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, ideally, ideally. So that that is something for our later stretch stretch goals. Um, some oh. sort of nemesis system. So we call it rival system. I mean, that's oh. not set in stone, but something like that. So holy shit, I I rather make sure I don't see. I pass that guy. Maybe I I go switch on the cloak, and make sure he doesn't see me, and I sneak past those kind of things. Oh. And um, maybe the next time you have a much better equipment, and then you say, well, hello everybody. How about a warm welcome? And you send a nuke over to him. Oh, nice. Let's see. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at the stretch goals now. Yeah, that's not unveiled yet, so I gave you a little head start oh. on this. So we, we have that up on our sleeves, depending where the campaign goes. Well, right now, according to Click Track, I just looked, you're... I mean, this fluctuates as the campaign goes, but right yeah. now, you're about around 40% of your goal, which is great, yep. you know? And you're trending toward 234% of your goal. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, that fluctuates during a campaign, obviously. But that's, that's pretty good. I mean, that shows that people want this. <clears throat> yeah, and there's also, um, we, we do have private investors, I call them. So basically friends and family, uh, oh, people nice. who, who want to support us. So they don't have a say in the creative direction. Actually, they don't even care and they don't understand how to make games. They just want to help us. And this whole that's Kickstarter awesome. campaign. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. And um, this, this whole Kickstarter campaign is sort of a green light proof of concept for them. So they in, will, will invest more into the title the more the community invests into it. Right. <clears throat> So let's talk about a little bit about the game. So basically, you play uh, a pilot in. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you play? Do you play? Are you a lone pilot? Are you in a? Are you in a military? Are you in the military? I mean, how does you, that you, work? You are on your own, but you will okay. meet other pilots. Sure, and you basically do these missions. Now, you basically like. 
It sounds like you have these randomly generated levels, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And so are the the levels, are they mission-based, or can you kind of fly around and find missions within them, or you can explore them? How do, like, the levels work? Because that's, that's a big thing about procedural mi- uh, games or, the, or is level generation. So how, does the level, yeah. how do the levels uh, work? You can, you can then explore them. So the game starts... Um you find yourself in the hangar, there's a ship, and then there's just um, a destination coordinate. That's all. That's all that, all that we give you. We don't explain oh, wow. who you are. We don't explain anything about those coordinates, <laughs> but you'll find them. You fly out and say, well, obviously, the only information that I have, so i rather try to get there. And then it's on you um, which systems you pick, and obviously, depending on your radar settings and so on, your sensors, you get more information about the uh, systems around you, which are dangerous, which uh, systems have special resources, some may be unknown, there may, there may be an anomaly sometimes um, that you can investigate. But you can also just say, no, I pass, I just move on and go to the next system. So. At Gamescom, somebody said, well, it sounds like you're doing, a, this is the love child of freelancer and FTL. So, and uh, I'd say, well, that's, that's a very good explanation, right? Mm. Um, so, or, have you played out there on mobile? It's also a great uh, role. Oh, yeah, I game. love that one. I love that and one. And super, yeah. super cool. And um, we, in quotes, we just combine that with those gorgeous visuals and um, have really good controls, action-focused controls, so we are not a sim. And um, so we don't have like thrust and anti-thrust, so it's right, really pick, right. up, pick up and play and action yeah. and in your face. The control, because I, I, I revisited Galaxy of Fire last night to kind of remind myself uh, how that played out. And yeah, the controls in that were really tight. Like I said, very freelancer-esque, but like a lot of other games tried to co- tried to do freelancer type controls and none of them really besides you guys nailed it like they did. I mean, you guys nailed it as well, but like you play stuff like Dark Star 1 or whatever one that was and a few other games and, and they get close, but but you guys really nailed just the fluidity and the seamless and the, I don't know if seamless is the right word, but it just, it just flows, you know, just like you're moving the mouse and you move how you feel you should move and it just works right. You know, so you yeah. guys nailed that. So I have every confidence in the world that you're going to nail it with this one as well. <laughs> but I wanted to ask... Ryan, looking at looking at the new one, yeah. it actually, it reminds me a little bit, not entirely, but a little bit of Zigfrak. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, it does. And Zigfrak... Zig, Zigfrak's a relative unknown in the, in the market. Which but. is sad because it's an excellent game. It's an excellent little ARPG shooty thing, which is crazy fun yeah it's uh, it, instead of being like a roguelike it's more diablo in space kind of you know a lot of a lot of loot pinata ships you know oh, they, the loot they just insane. explode into like you know things that you can pick up um but, but it's kind of neat um and and looking at this it, it kind of gives me the uh, vibe where it's like okay this is going to be a little bit more hardcore than that yeah uh, but but still you know kind of <clears throat> kind of like emphasis being on fun and accessibility more so 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 i wanted to ask you you were mentioning uh michael about the levels how like you might be able to go forward and like pass on a like you you see an anomaly but you don't have the stuff you don't have the right sensors to deal with it or something like that can you go back and forth between the levels you have already visited and the levels like it's not like is it like really that non-linear that you can just go back and choose where you go next but can you also go back to where you've already been um, no, everything is <clears throat> as everything is generated randomly. <clears throat> oh, okay. We don't we don't have a fixed persistent world. Oh wow! Like like, like you have in other schools, everything. If you if you don't take the the opportunity to investigate into something, it's gone. It's gone. Oh. And, we, and and actually, we want to have that. That's even better. Then, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Then it matters. <laughs> Yeah, but if you can come back and it's still there, so then you could grind, right? You go from system to system. Yeah. But every time we throw, we throw you in situations where you have to balance, what's the risk-reward mechanic here? So do I want to engage with those pirates and try to loot them? Or I just, yeah, I hide and uh, go around them and go for the safer path and collect some resources and make it to the next system by that. Right. And, uh, and that, 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 that sounds like it makes the choices on the fly a lot more interesting, which is what you want. You want that moment-to-moment gameplay 
to be really like, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? Which is what you want in a game like this, it sounds like. So you said collecting resources, and that's something I wanted to touch on. It sounds like because you have a crafting system too. So it kind of sounds like as you play, because I read somewhere like you could land on an asteroid and get fuel if you run out of I fuel as you play. No, it's not landing. You just you may have or seen something the, the, like gif, that. the gif the gif that you have seen with a laser. So you slice that asteroid oh. uh, to bits, and then you have fuel bits that you collect, and those fill up your hyperdrive, and then you can jump to the next system. Oh, that's uh, that gif. Yeah. By the way, is absolutely gorgeous. Where you're slicing, where <laughs> you're slicing you. that asteroid. That is beautiful. I think I might have gotten a little confused with Galaxy of Fire last night, where you do land on the asteroid and you have that kind of drilling mini yeah. game, which I did right. enjoy that, by the way. Uh, so tell, let's talk about the crafting because it sounds like you can craft on the fly. Yes, you can do. Yeah, um, you have blueprints um, that give you access to certain higher class um, propulsion systems, weapons, and whatnot. And with the resources that you collect during your run, you can craft those things. So and, you're not um, slave to, like so many space games, you have to go back to a space station to put that on. You know, but it sounds like that's not the case here. That is that is for the major upgrades. So, for instance, if you wouldn't want to install a new engine or a new set of wings, it would be even if it's a game very unrealistic. You're just on your journey. And say, hey, I have a new couple, a new set of wings, ploink, and then you have a bigger uh -huh. engine all of a sudden. Well, we could do that, and of course, we are breaking a lot of rules of physics here, but we whatever. We that, <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's a game, and that's kind of awkward. Um, <clears throat> so now those those major upgrades they those happen on their on the carrier where you start, um, but um, like the minor things um, those happen uh, on the run and also repairing the ship. So you will have damage, and then you have to decide. So I have valuable resources. Should I upgrade my current weapon, or instead I I rather repair my my hyperdrive or um, the shields, the armor, the weapons and whatnot. All oh, right, and it's the same resources to do either of those things. Exactly. So that's ah. again, there's, 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 there's a, although it's an action game, there's a strategic component to it that you have to decide where you spend re your resources. And again, it, it depends what's your personal play style. So if you prefer to go aggressive, I assume you invest your resources into weapons, whereas if somebody is more into <clears throat> exploring and getting resources, you might upgrade your, your shield. Oh, right. Okay, that sounds amazing. So you mentioned uh, a carrier. Is, mm -hmm. is that a persistent part of the game that you can fly back to? Like, how does the carrier work? Well, you start there. Every time you die, you start back on that carrier. I see. Okay. But there, and... will, be other, there will be other places in the game where other characters start. And oh. you will meet them sooner or later. Oh, that sounds great. So basically you go through and each system can be an opportunity to meet someone or to have a battle or to find some resources or to yeah, find... Or somebody, or somebody who helps you or somebody, somebody who seduces you or somebody who betrays you. You don't know. Oh. And so, like, the, the people you meet, they can give you missions on the fly as well. Like, I need help doing this. Yes. You know, help me clear out this sector or something like that. Oh, yeah, and, oh and again, you, you can decide, you know what, I don't care. <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't want to help you. Um, so that is something that we also took from Galaxy and Fire. Then people said, well, I love, uh, or they loved that, they, that we had a storyline that you could follow, but you hadn't had to. So you could always take uh, generic side missions. But in this case, it's like if somebody is offering you a side mission and you don't take it, the opportunity is gone. Oh, sorry, someone was asking in the chat, so you interact. That's a good question. Uh, on the carrier that you start on, uh, will there be other characters you can talk to as well? Will there be like people you can talk to on the carrier? Will there be like a bar? You know, like on the Tiger's Claw, will there be a bar? Will there be a hangar and blah, blah, blah? <laughs> no, there's, there's nobody going to tell you who you are, why you're there, and what's going to come next. You're, ah. absolutely, you're absolutely clueless. <laughs> you have to this. I gotta love it. Oh my god. I wanna play this. I wish we had a build. I wish we had a build, but it sounds like it's way too early for that. Um, yeah, it is. We're working on that. Yeah, it sounds like you it's, I think I read you just started working on it this year. 
Yes, we started early this year. That's correct. Oh my god, and it's already that gorgeous. I mean, just by the gifs in this video. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I mean, mean, I have to say, it's it's really it's a team that has been working together for the last ten years on space games on pretty much any platform. So I I think I I I think that's one of the reasons why we made good progress. And then also, I mean, I have to say that working with Unreal Four is it's a blast. We right. love it. It's uh, literally the guys are doing things and days that would have taken us months uh, prior uh, with with our own tech. So it's it's just amazing. Without did you look at other engines before you chose Unreal? Did you look at Unity and the other ones, or did you just go straight for Unreal? Because now it's like there's this choice in engine you could in, in these choices in game engines. Where yeah. if you want to make a game, you've got multiple options, which is relatively new in the in the gaming in the gaming world, it seems. Well, that is something we definitely have to thank mobile for, because this market is so big, and Unity really opened it up. So kudos mm. to them to come up with a new business model, which I believe made Epic open up as well, and that was just the right thing to do. So back. Back at Fish Labs, we hadn't had the chance to work with uh, with Unreal because it was simply it was out of range for us to sure. afford. Sure. Um, I have to say, I've never asked for it, so you could you could blame me on that. So one of my management mistakes was not not going back to Epic say, well, <laughs> I don't know how much it is, but it's probably too expensive. But I could have asked, but I didn't. Anyways, yeah. Um, yeah so uh, yeah, back in the days, we have been working with Unity on on a few projects, and um, our take is so. It's great for prototyping. I think it's great for a mobile title, but at the end of the day, it's it's a black box. Whereas with Unreal, if if you want to go with like yeah, almost infinite possibilities, and with a maximum quality, and and also with a certain perception about the technology in the market, um, that's it's just a different caliber. And um, last year we have been working for a top tier console publisher and he brought Unreal to the table and said, hey guys, what do you think about Unreal? Do you want to, uh, hands up, who's going to work with that or want to work with that? And then <laughs> all the hands went up and said, you, that's, that's awesome. That's how we got into Unreal. So the whole team has been working with Unreal 4 since early last year. Right. And then that title unfortunately didn't make it into full production um, oh. simply because they had a competing title in their portfolio. So that happens. But at the end of the day, it was kind of ironic. So it was a good thing for us because we were off the hook. So we could do um, the kind of space game that we always wanted to do and uh, with a tech that we had been then familiar with. So um, that was a pretty good head start for us. Was it a difficult transition to move into the Unreal Engine? Uh, no, it was just... So I'd say after two weeks or so, we had the first build running, and that looked great already. Two and then, weeks? Yes. Holy yes. shit! It's the blueprint system is awesome. It's, um, you get, as I said, you get things done in days. That would have taken us months or, let's say, weeks. So yeah. wait, Unreal, the engine has a blueprint system? Yeah, it does. How does that work? Oh, it's pretty straightforward. I'm not a coder myself, but I say even I could do it. It's you just um, open up the functions and you connect blueprints to each other. You have your parameters. You don't write a single line of code unless you want to, unless you want to achieve something super special, uh, something in particular that hasn't been covered by blueprints yet. And you could also use the blueprints just for prototyping. And if you want some extra optimization for it, you could do it in C++. So there are certain things like I know that um, Sven, our uh, tech guy, um, works on AI stuff. So he's, he, he plays around with blueprints. Yeah. And once he found a way to do it the, um, the right way, then certain things he puts into C++ code for more speed and performance issues. Oh, or, wow. uh, not issues, improvement. Yeah. So that makes it even easier. It sounds like it makes it even easier to develop than than I would have initially thought. Yeah, absolutely. And oh I mean, obviously, God. it's an it's um I'd say it's an advantage. Uh, for instance, our Marco, our lead technical artist, he rich shaders by himself for our proprietary uh, engine. Yeah. And for for him for him it was very very easy um, to get up and running with Unreal because he knew all the technical things how to write a shader and he said well this is so much easier now but he knew what he what he does and what how the shaders work and unreal gave him the tools to achieve great results much much faster 
Oh wow. Oh my gosh. So uh, I want I wanted to ask you: is it the is it the engine that allows you to not only have um, you know, this crafting on the fly, but also the uh, the module based damage that you're uh, that you're promoting? Because it sounds like you can have individual modules get damaged like your life support or it looks like individual weapons is that how that works yeah yeah absolutely so <clears throat> it really depends what get damaged um so we haven't designed yet so that will be part of the alpha testing if we take into account where your ship has been hit and then a certain system breaks down or if it's just randomly or if it's a combination of that so for instance if you get a hit from behind then it's more likely that your engines um, break down instead oh, wow. of if, if you got hit from the side and it's more likely your weapons fail uh, and so on that's oh man so wait what would now if, if that happened if your engines got knocked out you'd eventually just probably just get whittled down until you're killed it sounds like <laughs> yeah well it, <laughs> of course we can make it like you just go half speed uh, maneuver maneuverability goes down, those kind of things. So it's not a on and off switch, and it's it's not only just a numeric value. So it really has an impact on your gameplay, depending what system is damaged and how much. Oh, I see. I so see. is there uh, is there going to be any like um, workshop support or any type of modding support for this game? Uh, very good question. We had that on. Um, on Kickstarter, ask a lot. Um, we haven't decided on that yet, but as much as to our knowledge, Unreal supports that, and we're big fans of mods ourselves. So I, right now, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't do that. But it's right now, it's not just not on our priority list. First, we need to get uh, a great game right, out there. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, that makes sense. It's when you have something procedural like this, throwing throwing mods in probably could gum up the works whereas if you had something a little more linear you know that might make more well i'm sense. just saying like you know you could you know someone could add in their own ship colors or maybe like oh you know, i see or add a gun yeah, that you could some, find some. Add, like maybe add pieces of loot you know or new types of asteroids or something that you could but, i mean like like he said you know they're still working on the base game but i was just curious i didn't know if it was something that they uh gonna throw in just yet now I saw, I think it was in one of the GIFs, that uh, your life support can get hit. Mm -hmm. uh, now what happens, like, because I don't know if you've played Elite Dangerous, but when your life support, when your canopy gets shattered in that, you hear yourself start to suffocate slowly at one point. Uh, is that something that will happen uh, in this game as well? Like if your life support gets hit, will you, slow, will you have to either somehow fix the, fix the thing or like, like, what's, what, what are the options in that kind of scenario if your life support gets hit? Well, I mean, if you run out of oxygen... Right. You, you die. Sure. <laughs> but, I mean, how, do you, how uh, do you fix that? Do you fly back to your carrier? <clears throat> do you try and get some resources to, to fix it on the fly? Like, yeah, what are your... you, can, you, can, you, can, you can gather more oxygen as a resource. Oxygen will, run off, will be one of the resources. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And if you die, you start at the carrier again. Oh, I see. Now, well, like, so it sounds like there are different resources you can mine from different, like, will different asteroids have specific resources, or will the, the asteroids have, like, a random resource that you find when you, once you blow them up? Like, will um, it be yeah. like, oh, is that an oxygen asteroid, and that's a metal asteroid, you know, is that sort of thing? How is yeah, that going to work? Yeah, yeah we, we definitely ha will have different resources. Right now, I cannot say how many, because obviously that has a big impact sure. on, on the overall gameplay, but Certainly, I mean, again, look at uh, FTL or out there. They had plenty of resources. Right. I'm not sure if we're going to go crazy like that because right. we, we also have the combat system and um, we want to avoid that this gets too complicated, that you're fiddling around with too many types of resources. Right. Um, so that, that is something we will see from our alpha test, how, how that goes and what's the, the feedback from the community. Oh, okay. All right, because, uh, well, no, I, what I was mainly curious about is, like, if you need oxygen, how do you know when an asteroid might have oxygen? You know what I mean? Like, how do you, like... No. Simple as, uh, answer to that, you have sensors. And, I mean, depends okay. on the equipment of your ship, you will have sensors. Those right. sensors will have different ranges. 
those sensors will have different capabilities. And if you're equipped with the right stuff, the right gear, you know what those asteroids provide. And uh, if you don't have such a sensor, it's like best of luck. You just give it a try. Oh, I see. Maybe it's just dirt, but maybe it's some, something, something super cool. So, so if you needed oxygen, you didn't have the right sensors, and you mined like eight asteroids as, as, as your timer just goes down and down and down. And like, yeah. I can't find oxygen. Dead. Yeah. Pressure, <laughs> pressure, pressure. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that sounds awful yet awesome at the same yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm getting very, so, so, okay. So you start off with a ship and you go to a destination, you could upgrade your ship. So are you going to, going to be able to have one ship that you constantly upgrade? Are you going to be able to like maybe acquire different ships? As, as uh, blueprints, for example? Uh, how is yeah. that going to work? Um, you start with one ship, and okay. uh, we will have uh, adding the, the, the possibility of flying other ships as a stretch goal. Ooh. That is something that we, that we learned from Galaxy Fire. We had, I, I think, 40 or 50 ships in Galaxy Fire, and um, I think it were only four or five that um, the players really used. So oh, the majority okay. of them was just a waste, and, and uh, we should have put the, the resources, spent the resources, our resources uh, somewhere else instead. So this time around, we thought we rather have one ship and um, you you upgrading this. So you could say to a certain degree, you are the ship. Oh. So it's like your, your upgrading progression is with this one ship. And of course, you are, the reward in dying is going back to the carrier, upgrade your ship. And if you would constantly change that, um, there is no such a reward. It's like, okay, I get another ship. But in this case, it's like every time you die, you gradually improve, which is like, again, what, what uh, Shadow of Mordor does. If you die, you get your XP points. You go back to your skill tree and look for new skills that you can unlock. And you're like, uh, yeah, I died. I just got those 5, 10, 50 uh, XP points that were missing to make it to the next level in my skill tree. Okay, so you know what thought process that reminds me of? That reminds me of uh, Battlestar Galactica. Whenever you would kill, like they they said in the show that like when you when you die, what's a better training tool than death to come back and yeah. uh, ah. get better and stuff like that with like oh, the right. Cylon Raiders and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think about Edge of Tomorrow when we when we were doing the, the oh. design of the game. We watched Edge of Tomorrow and. I love that film. Oh, yes. And Tom Cruise is oh, like, no, 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 yes. don't kill me, don't kill me, don't kill me. And she's like, bam, shoots him, say, well, you have another life. And um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you come back better. And then he knows a little bit more. And then he does all this stuff, meets the same people, and, and they, they come up with something. Say, so, yeah, I know that already. And he comes with a different answer and progresses until the next point. Uh, and then he dies, starts from scratch with the experience and has another run. The, the fact that you referenced that movie in regards to this game just makes me that much more excited about it because that movie is goddamn amazing. Yeah. Oh, my God. I want to watch it again right now. Right <laughs> fucking Me too. Now. Me too. Yeah, I love that. But it sounds like in terms of ship progression, you're going more the, the shooter route than the freelancer route because, like, in freelancer, yeah, there's, like, a billion ships, but you you know which ones you want to fly eventually, you yeah. know. And... um. And so you just work toward them. So that sounds that sounds pretty cool. Give them give them fewer yet more awesome goals, mm -hmm. you know. Which which sounds like I didn't know that there were there were so few ships that people flew in Galaxy of Fire. I don't remember how many I flew. Yeah, and you know what? If you design all those ships and you spend a lot of work into this and, and a lot of uh, passion, it's it's kind of disappointing. It's like what? Nobody bought this. This is cool, or just a few. And but there was a you know what? There was a flaw in game design. We simply made too many ships pretty similar, and there was oh. only you know when you when you when you buy a new ship you do that because it has better abilities, be better stats. Right. And there were certain ships that were so much better, like in the next class, you just uh, drop anything else. And um, yeah, with better game design, I mean we're learning, right? Right. Um, you come to the point and say, no, we just need a few ships. We're not, we're not, it's not like a racing game where you have, oh, it's great, I ride a Porsche, an Audi, and, and you know, you have fans of certain brands of cars. True, right. If you, if you do a space game, a game and where you don't have, let's say, fame for certain brands and such, the only meaning to have a new uh, vessel is 
better abilities, maybe a little bit of design, but it's basically because uh, of certain gameplay mechanic. So if you don't design the game in a way that there's enough motivation to get the new ship, you did something wrong. And clearly there was one of our flaws in Galaxy and Fire with 40 ships, kind of cool. We should have had, I'd say, five right. and make, make a deeper progression within those ships or have... Oh, that's... have have more like class types, like a scout, a gunship, and so on. So right, that reminds me of Privateer, which I think had like four, mm -hmm. like four ships, and that was it. And they were clear, like what they did. Like you had the fighter, yeah. you had the the big cargo ship, and then you had the intermediate cargo fighter thing. Uh, so I see where I still, uh, yeah, that totally works. So I have a question because I'm watching the video, you know, that we've got on loop, and one thing keeps coming by. And it's the guy with the Oculus Rift on. Mm -hmm. And so obviously you're going to have support for that. But I also see that he's got a Leap Motion glued onto the front of it. And I'm yeah. wondering what you're doing with that. Because I borrowed <laughs> one of those from a friend of mine and I could find absolutely no use for it whatsoever. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's the fact that you've actually figured out something to do with it impresses the hell out of me. Oh, what, yeah, is yeah. It, what is the thing, Jim? It's a leap motion. It's basically it's guess, a hand guess, track. Gesture, gesture control, uh, 3D gesture control within VR. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, well, the, the minimum that we, that we can see and that those are things that we have played around with yet is simply by operating the game like menu style and so on. And um, while we won't have anything during combat, because obviously you have uh, one hand is on a mouse, one hand is on a keyboard. Right. Um, things that we could see is like if you upgrade your ship, you could have these gesture controls like in 3D space, you spin your ship, look from different angles, pick certain things, and then um, apply those upgrades to your ship. These things we believe could be super cool to do that with Leap Motion, just as an idea. Yeah. Well, I'm just, um, did, is it like all proprietary code that you had to write to do that? Because the normal um, the way that you set that thing is behind your keyboard facing up, right? And then whenever you get mm -hmm. your hand in front of the screen. So it actually, um, to, to kind of clue Brian in, it, it's, it's basically like a connect that sits on your desk, but it only oh, watches yeah. your fingers, right? Oh. And yeah. And it sits behind your keyboard and faces up. So when you get your hand between the keyboard and the screen, it's watching what your fingers are doing. So oh. then you can manipulate things on the screen. Theoretically, it's in 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 theory, it's a lot better than it was in practice, at least with the stuff that was shipping back when I tried it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but for you guys to change the orientation of it and actually stick it on your face, watching your hands in front of your face, that's kind of a a different. Uh, angled and it's used to. So I didn't know if you had to like scratch write all the code for that, or they actually have something that it'll adjust. Yeah, um, let's put let's put it this way: we're, we're in close talks with Leap Motion. I met the guys at uh, E3, um, really great guys, and uh, they were they saw what what we were up to. I showed them an, uh, an even earlier earlier version of what you have uh, on Kickstarter right now of Everspace. And they said, oh, it would be super cool to have that tag on there. And um, so we were really early days playing around with it. And we said, okay, those are the things that we could imagine to work. And um, yeah, I cannot unveil too much at this point, um, but they support us in, in, in a great way uh, to get oh, that. Okay. Uh, yeah, because if you got first yeah. party support on it, then it's, it'll be good. Yeah, um, yeah, because it's, it's the thing of like, I like the idea of that thing so much. Uh -huh. it, it's just that nobody had come up with a way to actually use it for anything practical. So is it yeah. kind of it's, like a minority report thing? Yeah, or? I was thinking well, yes, Iron Man. I would say that the closest right now would be Iron Man. When, you, when, when Robert Downey Jr. is in his uh, workshop down there and uh, right. talks to Javis, Javis and all this shit flies around and he sees the blueprints and he, he turns them in 3D space and so on. So imagine that uh, for our upgrade process of your ship. You know what you should nice. also do with that? Like you have this missile launcher that can launch like 80 missiles and you just <laughs> tap the targets on your screen. And then yeah, like, yeah. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, but, but that, that would, I'm, I'm, that, I but... think that would break the controls. Um, oh, yeah. so, oh, so right now we're, we're looking for things um, to implement that uh, outside of the core combat. I see. So speaking outside of the car, car combat, Odyssey in the chat uh, mentions... 
He said, give us a Deep Space Nine bar. And that got me thinking, are there going to be places in this pla- places you could stop, like space stations and stuff where you could meet people? Or is it all going to be in space in your cockpit? Um, no, we will have bigger, how do you say, constructions where you meet uh, people and so on. And where also story bits uh, could be unveiled. And um, like the like safer places to uh, refuel, get o- oxygen, and so on. And those places could be also used, um, yeah, to interact with other characters. Oh, very cool. Okay, that's good. So yeah, because that is something people liked in Galaxy Fire. Like every station had a bar where you met all those uh, strange guys offering yeah. you, <laughs> yeah, jobs. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that adds flavor, and that I mean that that's kind of a trope now, but it works. You know, like Privateer did it, and Freelancer did it, and oh yeah, so... because it adds to the lore and um, the whole setting. Oh, sorry, that was that was Zach on. Yeah, sorry, Odyssey, that was. I'm being corrected in the chat room because I'm an idiot. <laughs> so, um, so it sounds like you have this story progression that you go through and you have to die and you keep moving and you keep moving. So what happens when you get to the end? Is does Can you start a whole new story and it's different? Or, or is there a new game plus mode? Like what happens when you finally get to that end point and you want to keep um, playing? Yeah, so <clears throat> this major event that happens when you met all the other guys, um, this will unlock a new, a new stage of the game. Right. And um, we, will, we will have a way that you can keep playing this. Um, we haven't decided yet if we really continue with the story after that point. So that will take about 20 hours to get there. And that, we think that's the scope that feels about right. Yeah, that ain't nothing. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good length. Yeah. Okay, and um, after you reach that point, there's a, there's this major event, and then um, there will be a new situation for yourself. Let's put it this way, and this new situation could be a start for for DLC or even a sequel. Depends how Ooh. successful. You are. Oh, okay, that's cool. But it sounds like there's going to be enough variety that. Uh, that even when you finish, you want to start again to see different options and different systems and different, you know, like, oh, I helped that guy last time. If I run into someone like that again, I'm going to kill him and see what happens. So yeah, it sounds yeah. like there's enough, there are enough options in the moment to moment gameplay that'll, that'll make you want to come back and try different things. Like, oh, yeah, this, we have... sorry, yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say last time I did a lot of cloaky f- fly away <laughs> stuff. This time I want to shoot yeah. everyone, you know? Right. And if you have a super great experience and said, well, my, my experience was just awesome and so on, um, we're thinking of, that's something we need to test, we're thinking of that you can pass your game seat to a friend. Oh. So, so the way we roll the dice uh, for this, um, obviously that's just a very uh, little piece of code. You can share to others and then they try that. That is something we haven't tried yet, but Theoretically, concept-wise, this should work. That is something that we have our, as our social feature, if you want to call it like that. So, hey, that's, play that's my cool. rogue experience in Everspace. Or maybe not even that's make really it a cool. maybe not even make it a file like this game we were playing, uh, Space Beast Terrafight. Uh, their seeds are numbers. They're these these, new, these string of eight numbers. Mm-hmm. So maybe have a like a unique string that'll generate that particular. Uh, galaxy for people that they can just share in like a post or an email or whatever. Maybe that might yep. even work too. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know. It gives me, it gives me like flashbacks to Nintendo save codes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! You remember? You remember having to like type in that thing on Metroid because you couldn't actually save the game. You just had to write a code down. And the wow. Well, <laughs> this is the same <laughs> thing with like a lot Sorry, of games back there. Back oh, right. Yeah, like Mega Man. Did a lot of games so, do that back then? Oh yeah. Because yeah, they didn't figure yeah. out to put oh, yeah. batteries in the cartridges until many years into the whole Nintendo generation. Huh. There you go. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, so yeah. So uh, right now the Kickstarter is doing well. How are you finding? How are you finding that? Because I found I have found when we ask people how that's going, like either they didn't expect it to be another full time job, or they were prepared. Like, how did you prepare? for Kickstarter and how are you finding it so far? (laughs) Um, Yeah, we started preparing Kickstarter four months ago. Oh, wow. 
Yes, and um, <clears throat> I'd say you don't have time for anything else but Kickstarter. I believe uh, it. In, yeah. in combination with preparing uh, Greenlight on Steam, in combination preparing <laughs> reaching out to the press at Gamescom, and um, at least marketing-wise, we are in crunch for the last three weeks or so. Um, the weekend before Gamescom, Friday was until five in the night, Saturday four, Sunday three. One of our guys didn't sleep at all. He just uh, worked the night through, went to the train, off to Gamescom. Every day at Gamescom, 10 o'clock first meeting, all the way to 2 a.m. Oh. in the night. Um, oh, my God. It is, it, it, on the one side, it's, it's super exhausting. On the other side, it's it keep, it's so exciting. And when when the first backers coming in and you get that feedback, also the feedback on Greenlight. I mean, we got fifteen thousand yes votes with an eighty six percent exception rate, or I don't know how to say that positive uh, feedback. So by average, you get like forty five percent yeses versus noes, and we got eighty six percent made it up to number two out of 1500 games waiting for green light that's just awesome and that keeps you going 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 and um, when those those uh, pledges come in and it goes up uh, I would say there, there's nothing better in the world than that <laughs> um, but it's it's uh, it's challenging I think we have 10 channels where we get uh, feedback from the community so it's the comments on the Kickstarter's page it's direct messages we got two Twitter accounts. You get direct messages on both. I got my personal Facebook account. I got a corp corporate Facebook account and a game Facebook account. You get your messages. You got email. You have YouTube. Um, yeah, everything and press. Oh, and then we are using Mailchimp for um, reaching out to the press and to our fans, and you get emails there as well. Oh dear God. So yeah. Oh dear God. That's a game in itself. Yeah, it sounds like managing that, handling that. Um, I've honestly, but... I've obviously been tempted there. Like the more, I, the more people do Kickstarter and stuff, the more like, I work in SEO. I could do this sort of thing for people. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I want to do this sort of thing for people. <laughs> I've, I've been tempted to like make my own little side business where I do this sort of thing for people, so you guys can focus on the game. That sounds really tempting right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it's it does yeah. Every time I talk to people about Kickstarter, they they say what how, what how exhausting it is. But you guys have a I gotta say you guys have a great pitch, uh, a really great because I see so many Kickstarters for space games, where they don't have enough imagery or they don't have enough video or they don't have enough text or like their text isn't very uh, clearly written and like people are like, what are you actually doing and like. So you guys, I got to say, you guys have a well, very well made, very clear. Like I love, I love the reward tier chart. I love shit like that. You know, where it's very <laughs> okay. clear, you know, very clear. This is what you get in the very, very like transparent and clear. And I, I just love that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's not, it's not like this is just the, the work of somebody else and myself. It is really, it's, it's a complete team effort. Everybody had a say on anything and uh, we're using confluence um to do all our internal stuff and you should see how how the team in quotes was yelling at certain things i was writing said no you cannot write that that's that's not the way it is and um so that's the right it has the wrong tone how about that so we were <laughs> we were discuss discussing on on word level sometimes so no this is it really we really wanted to make sure that we that we did we describe exactly the kind of game we want to make to get that pitch out and then collect the feedback from our fans, from the community, and then work together on it. And I think that is something that so far we have accomplished. We have a solid foundation. So there's this very positive feedback, and now we want to take it from there, keep working with the community. Um, I don't know if you've seen, I've updated the FAQs last night, 2 o'clock or something, oh. and added more stuff. Um, because obviously, I mean, if, if you open up, a lot of questions come in. And right. then we, we want to answer all those questions and we want to make sure this is the game that we're going to do and as good as possible with the feedback from the community and the budget that we have. So we're not going to promise to anything that we cannot afford and that's not simply not doesn't work for us or it's technically not feasible or we don't have the budget. And we say, no, we, we cannot do that. Um, but here's what we can do. 
Right. And and I like that because so many I Kickstarter is a weird thing where if you try and promise the world and it doesn't look like you can deliver, no one's going to you know, no one's going to back you. Yeah, and, and for God's sake, don't put planetary landings as a stretch goal. <laughs> we, we, we heard that already. And uh, no, this is not going to be going to be a stretch goal. Not the landing. It's yeah, different. this is all space. You don't, you, this, this kind I'm, of game doesn't need planet stuff. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not bitter. I'm just. Oh, I'm stop. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my last sentence. There was a hint. Oh, <laughs> I want. I want to. I want a little rover. I want. To, I want to go roving around on. You guys. <laughs> but it's actually. A, but it's actually a robot dog named Rover, and you get to drive him. Around. No. Okay. <laughs> no. No. It's, 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 it's that no, dog no, from. It's not landing. I said it's not landing. Oh. Okay. That is a hint of no, something. It's not. It's not on the planet. It's not on the planet. We have something that has different gameplay, but it's not. You're not going to land on a planet. That would be a completely different game. Oh, oh, for us. wait a, wait for a minute, for wait a minute, for us. wait a minute. Are you saying <laughs> it's another game you're working on? Is that what you're <laughs> saying? You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this one first, okay? Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> and then we, then, then we see how it goes. So, yeah, Jim, you remind me of uh, your your probe in Elite Dangerous. They should just call it Muffet. They should just... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Oh God! Let's, I'm let's... so glad that wasn't in the new show. And yet, <laughs> I wish that it was on some level. It wouldn't have it worked. Would... That, that, that kind of that kind of do, 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 that thing no, that it, kind it of would have worked really well. They no, it would. Elfers snap its neck in the first show. <laughs> and then just... <laughs> oh man, you just see you just see the the Cylons lighting daggets on fire. You know, just shooting them with a blazer la laser blast enough to just burn them. Yeah, that's what that show would have done. <laughs> it would have gone. They would have shown them going extinct. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you know what Brian's talking about? It was the the dog. It was like a robot dog that was on the original. Yeah, battle. It had a chimpan it had a chimpanzee in it. Did it? Oh, okay. No, it didn't. It didn't. Yeah, that was that that was on the original show. The dagger had a chimpanzee in it. What? I know more about your all 70s show than you do. I feel so did. bad for that chimpanzee. No, it didn't. Are you serious? Go look yeah. this shit up. Oh, I'm, I'm looking this up right now. I, 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 that, it did not have a chimpanzee in it. I can't. I, I, I can't. Well, in the new one, it would have been played by Andy Serkis. <laughs> nope. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> Uh, it was really good. I like that one a lot. Uh, better, 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 better. Go read uh, up on it, man. I'm trying to. Hang on. I think he's channeling Tweaky or something. Beady, there, beady, so. beady. Uh, yeah. Moffitt Moff was the name of Boxy's Daggett. Right? Yes, I know that. I know yeah. that. Wow. I know, I, know, I know the name of... Uh, wow, well, apparently there's a person nearby named Muffet in uh, Burbank, apparently. Uh... I, I have such a hard time believing this. I think you are totally trolling me. I think you are totally. Oh God, no, you're right. It was named by a chimp. It was played by a chimpanzee named Evolution. Yep. The chimpanzee was named Evolution. You guys, that was the name of the chimp that was inside the daggett named Muffet. Oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do anything for the rest of the day except think of that. I'm supposed to go to work and be productive, and I won't be able to. Like, like at all. Like, there's no way. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, we go on tangents on this no show voice, every no now voice. and again, uh, Michael. Um, anyway, so you guys started Everspace earlier this year. How far along would you say you guys are? Um, yeah, it's we call it a pre-alpha. And right. um, we expect to have the alpha early next year. I have so, to wait till early next year to play this? Mm. Well, oh. it, it, it's, let's put it this way. If we make very good prog progress, I'd rather come with the good news and say, well, guys, guess what? We have it a little bit earlier than the other, other way around. Sorry, it takes longer. So I say now it's going to be early the, uh, next year. Oh, and then we're if surprised it's, when it's earlier. Uh, <laughs> Yay, expectations. Yay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I like that. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. No, that, that's fair because you, you just started working on it earlier this year. I, mean, mm -hmm. I don't think people, 
I guess it's a double-edged sword to how transparent game development has become. Because if you look at Star Citizen, people are like, how come you guys have done shit? And it's like, wait a minute. Games take a long time to make. I forgot that. I'll be honest. I forgot that. Until someone reminded me that, like, Elder Scrolls Online took seven years to make. And you're like, oh, right. Games take a long time to make. I should relax. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and we're just, we're just 14 guys. So, um yeah, <laughs> we don't have the scope like the big titles. Uh, still, things need some time, even if you have more people working on it. So, as we say, nine women don't give birth to a baby in one month. There's certain things that take time. Right. Um, same with game development. It's it's tough because sure part would make things easier though, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's tough because part of me is like, I want to play this now, and part of me is like, take your time to make it good. So it's it's it's. It's this internal thing where it's like, oh, I need it, I want it now, but wait, I want it to be good. I don't want it to be shit. So, take take the yeah, time I mean, you need to make nobody, it good. Nobody, nobody will cry if if it takes a little bit longer, and um, no. people will cry about it takes longer. But then once we have a great game, everybody's happy. People forget they, about if, that. People forget about exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. If, if it's the other way around, if you ship something. That's then say, oh, great. it's out there. Everybody excited, and then if it doesn't work, everybody will remember that forever. That's true. We delivered a shitty, shitty game, and we just don't want to do that, right? We don't want to disappoint. So we make sure that everything is nailed and everything. And this is why we give the alpha and the beta to to our fans, to our backers. They can come back with feedback, and um, so we make sure that it's really everything for the budget that we have, the amount of people that we are. Um, what the platform can deliver and what the tech can do. It's the best game, space, space shooter that we can possibly do. And I got to say, I'm looking at your tiers, which I, the, you, the, another thing you did right was the spacing out of the tiers. It's, they're very reasonable. But it amazes me that you have a uh, 7,000 euro tier already. I, I mean, someone is backed at the 7,000 euro three level. Guys, three guys backed. It's oh really? You know what? Oh, I see. I see. There are two seven thousand yeah. level, and one's limited. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. No, we didn't. We didn't expect that at all. So My the first one God. came came in day one uh, from a German Galaxy Fire fan from South Germany. Whoo! Uh, yeah, and we're like, whoo, that's cool. We reached out to him and said, hey, do we know you? And said, no, we don't. I don't know, uh, know you, but I've played games really the very, very early on in, in the even in the 80s and everything. I'm super fan of space games. I just love what you do, and I want to support you. And he's he's a little bit older, um, so it seems like he can afford it. And he's wow. super friendly, and that was just great. Wow. And then the next day, we were sold out on a 7,000 tier, somebody from the States, said, oh, I love Galaxy and Fire, it's awesome, I want to be part of the, the team and I can't wait to see you, visit the office and work with you guys on, on this. And then we got somebody else who pledged already and said, oh, damn, the 7,000 tier is gone. I wanted to have that too and uh, I want to work with you on that game. And we were like, what can you do? Can you, can you put up another tier for 7K? And we were like, hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, we were like, well, of course, that would be fabulous and everything. But we don't know what the other two guys are thinking of it because obviously it, it, um, it dilutes the exclusivity of, a, of the top tier uh, reward. So we reached out to them say, hey, thanks, thanks again. And there's, there's a third guy who wants to support us with 7,000 euros. What do you think about that? And say, well, actually, this is awesome because you're getting your funding goals sooner. And uh, we love to have another guy on board. So this is why we opened up another tier. Wow. That, that that's incredible that that, yeah. is, that is yeah, absolutely um, incredible and that's what blows my mind I, I i keep wondering like for 10 years we had very few space sims you know mm -hmm. and i'm and I'm, I'm thinking developers there was money on the table people wanted these things it's obvious look at all the games that are coming out that people are paying for but you yeah know. i think i think it's it's um it's yeah. both things the, the the space sim games were the first that were in 3D because obviously doing stuff in 3D in space is not so complicated compared to running around, for instance, like in Call of Duty or Battlefield where you have to build a lot of stuff. That's true. And um, so that's why space games were first. Then after a few years, it was like most things you can do in a space game back then with the technology has been done. Then less and less space games were made, first-person shooters came up, and um, so there was a less of a demand. Publishers went for the big successful first-person shooters. And with everything, if for a certain time 
there is an underserved genre, there's a Ronin songs, and this is exactly what happened. I mean, if we came up with Galaxy Fire, the first version, that was back in end of 2005 on a Sony Ericsson device. Oh gosh. Where the screen size was 128 by 128 pixels. <laughs> I remember. Size size th was I remember that. 350 kilobytes, and it was a 3D game with a numpad control on a on a feature phone, and it was fun to play. That's how we started, and. Galaxy Fire has in total 30 million installs on mobile devices. So, to a certain degree, I think we kind of kicked that off uh, with this uh, renaissance in space games because, you know what, we did a space game on mobile because that was the only thing you could do in 2005. There was no hardware acceleration. Everything was software rendered and so on. So, that was it. And with like another space, uh, with, with another star system, introducing uh, more ships and such, that's how we gradually uh, evolved with Galaxy and Fire until the iPhone came and then all of a sudden you had almost console quality, depending on what generation we're start talking of, on your mobile phone. Yeah. And uh, now we're here, now we're on PC and hopefully on console with Everspace. Yeah. yeah, I gotta say thank you for coming <laughs> to thank you for coming to the PC market because because yes. for a while it was like all these great games coming out on mobile, and it's like wait a minute why where's the why aren't the why isn't the PC getting love and now the PC is getting lots of love, and uh, I'm very happy about that because <laughs> it yeah, deserves. True, because yeah, and, and with a small team like us, or a fairly small team, you can do a great game for the PC because you don't have to bother about free-to-play monetization, you don't need to have a back-end, you don't have to have to have your marketing experts improving the funnel and all this stuff. I mean, we went through all this, our PPU and lifetime value on blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we all get, seriously, it was like, I, I was trying for a year to get Fish Labs uh, another funding round. I, I talked to literally everybody. And they all said, oh, I don't know, space games, you know, hmm, is there really a market? If you're not Star Wars, if you're not Star Trek, it's kind of hard. And we were like, well, but at that, back in the days, we had like 25 million people playing Galaxy and Fire, so how about that? Yeah, but you haven't proved that you can do the monetization. Yeah, and so, long story short, so then, yeah, move on. If, if the premium model doesn't work um, for games like that on mobile anymore, we do PC and console. And, of course, our team is so excited with, with the rendering power that you have in particular on PC. And then now VR. So, I mean, you are literally in space if you have your VR headset. So, yeah, it feels great. And we still can do mobile because Unreal supports mobile. And if you hit the stretch goal, of course we will have it. And it's going to be paid. It's not going to be free to play. Pay once, play forever. See, that's what that's what kind of annoys me about free to play. Like, it, it still, it, it bugs me because like it's not, I don't see it as being sustainable in the long term. People don't like being nickel and dimed. At I mean, they like getting stuff for free, but they don't like paying. But they don't want to pay for stuff after. So well, no, it's, like, it's it's bad on both sides because yeah. it discourages people from buying the premium game because hey, I, well, I could just waste time with this free thing. But then it also sours the market because then it's like, oh, well, all these games suck. Yeah, so, I, I'm I've I'm see I've seen only a couple examples where it really works well, like maybe Lord of the Rings Online, and and Rift and stuff. Like it, I think it works. It seems to work well for them, but for a lot of places, it doesn't seem to work that great. Yeah, yeah, it works so, great in lots of things online. Actually, I'm I have a lifetime account and lots of things online. I love to play it. That's ooh. awesome. And I yeah, I bought that for 120 euros back then, so that was a bargain if you're really playing it actively. And a very good friend of mine, he's he's really like. On, on, on the cheaper side, really uh, very, very, uh, um, he's saving his money. And, um, but he wanted to play with us, so he opted in for a free to play account in um, a lot of the rings online. Obviously, he spent more time to get to a certain point. And every now and then, if he wants to go on a raid with us, he, he had to buy certain content. And he was fine with that because he said, well, no, the experience is great. Now I want to play with my buddies and they're uh, in a certain area and I haven't unlocked that yet with my grinding. I have to pay for that. So he put his credit card, paid for that, and we could play together. No, no hard feelings from neither side. That was very great. Also, I, I, I think Turbine does a great job there. Yeah, exactly. They're doing a good job because they give you enough for free that you feel like you can get somewhere. But like, if you want to get to Moria or whatever, like yeah. that, that, I mean, it costs money to make that. So, you know, 
it costs money to get there, you know, and they're kind of, and that makes sense. But like, when you got something like Farmville, where if you want your crops to, you know, come earlier, pay us like two dollars. It's like screw you. <laughs> yeah, I, the thing, the thing that I like in freemium stuff is whenever it doesn't alter the gameplay, but it is. It adds sort of to it. Enhance, it ha- well, yeah. It's like it's like an elite, right? Like I can buy skins for my ship. I don't need it. It doesn't make the ship perform any different. Right. But if I want it, I can throw them a little bit of money, you know, and and that's fine. Um, but you know, I mean, there's some games that that do it right. You know, it's um, and various like MMOs, you know, where where you have different sides of the spectrum. You know, where where it's like, well, this this thing is is free and it's fun, and I never need to spend a dime if I don't want to, but then they rely on the people that get in there and say, oh, well, I'm going to, you know, spend a lot of money in here. So, you know, it's one side makes up for the other, but, I, but I just kind of, I don't know. It's, I, I don't know if I, if I fault freemium for screwing up the market as much as I do bundles. And that, that's the thing. Maybe I, I should just ask Michael, did, have you guys ever put, um, like the the first game, did you ever participate in any bundles with that? And and if so, was it worth it? Um, with Galaxy Fire, you mean? Yeah. Um, on mobile, no, we hadn't had any bundles uh, back in the days. That wasn't possible on the App Store, as much as I recall mm. it. Um, Galaxy Fire had been part of the humble bundle, uh, humble bundle uh, on Steam. Mm. Yeah, it, specifically that. I mean, did you, yeah. did you guys see a significant return on that? Because <sighs> mm. I figure it's like. Okay, there's ten games for a dollar. Like everybody yeah. gets, you know, a couple pennies. So do you not, do you move enough units to actually feel a difference? Not or, so much. Or, or not, are you not so much. Twenty dollars sales. Mm. No, <laughs> no. I mean, definitely worth it to have the exposure. And even if you don't make that that much money, you just have more people out there. And if you yeah. have a good game, they they talk about it, and then other people might get it for a higher price. Um, but still, it's uh, we're not talking about something where even uh, a smaller team like us could have sustained. So back in the days, Galaxy Fire 2 on the PC, well, it lacked the DLCs um, because uh, as a story, as I said in the beginning, investors, free to play on mobile, blah, blah, blah. Um, we wouldn't have made enough money uh, to keep the even the small team running for the game back in the days, um, which which is fair because it was a mobile game. Even the code base of the PC game was still the same code that we had been running on um, on the Java feature phones in 2008. So the initial initial Galaxy Fire 2 was a one megabyte Java game. And then gradually we improved the graphics and everything, but the AI, the whole trading, the traveling, all these things had been absolutely identical in the iOS version, even in the PC version, which ended up being 1.2 or 1.5 gigabytes, which is also the reason why it was really code-wise on its last legs. We could not add anything more. Um, The community said, oh, we want to have another DLC, but it was simply the code would have been, I don't know, fallen apart <laughs> if we had put uh, more into this. So we had to try something new. Then the whole free-to-play shit for us happened. And um, there you go. Then we start, okay, from scratch, new studio. And without any code-wise, any legacy. So mm-hmm. And obviously with Unreal, a much better tech than we had back in the days with our own tech. Right. Yeah, I was I was just I was having a conversation with somebody earlier this morning, and uh, we're just discussing, you know, like what what the combination of of like freemium games, and then the whole bundle picture, and then with Steam how they how they do their like every quarter like clockwork they have a sale where things go fifty percent seventy five percent off, and I wonder if the consumer is just being trained, you know, it's it's like well. I'll just wait because you know this game that just came out today in six months it'll be seventy five percent off. So I'll I'll just delay until then. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, I mean it, we, we yeah we are concerned to 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 a certain degree about this race to the bottom because that's pretty much the race uh, to the bottom that we have seen on the App Store for paid games. Right, mm. and it, and it made it a lot more difficult, right? And then yeah, yeah. also also the lack of curation in Steam because it it used to be you know there was a barrier to entry there you had to be a certain quality. And now just about anything gets on there. So you have so much, so much signal to noise, 
you know, um, that it's, it's hard to get seen unless you are sort of a triple A title or you get a lot of attention elsewhere that directs people in. So that, that's a, a kind of a concern of, of mine just, you know, for the hobby that I love that, you know, I, I can see where a lot of developers would say, look, this just isn't sustainable anymore because it costs, it costs X number of thousand dollars to create the game. Mm. And if we can't get at least twice that much back, then it's not worth doing. Yeah, but Versus, you, you know what, that is with every market. In particular, if this is a digital market, if there's access to it from pretty much anywhere around the globe, you're competing with the whole world about this market. And as hard as it is on, on, on Steam and also on the App Store, I think there hasn't been a better time to making games than today with all the tools that we have, yeah, with, with stores, with hundreds or a hundred million plus people signed up with their credit cards on file. Remember how it was in the 90s or something. You had to go through a publisher and mm. they controlled everything. So yes, now there is a lot of competition, but still it's in your hands. It's in your hands what kind of game you do. It's in your hands how do you uh, communicate with your fans. Um, everything is in your hands. So Yeah, it's, it's just the concern of, uh, you know, like, I could I could take six months or a year, and and create something that you know that I've put a lot of effort in, and then somebody comes out with some flappy bird thing that they made in 15 minutes and they make a million dollars. Yeah, that and, hurts. I know. You know. I yeah, that hurts. Yeah, I have to admit. <laughs> You're like seriously. But, so it, so it almost seems like let's make as many little things as I can as fast uh, as I can. Yeah, and one but, of but them. again, yeah, but again, you know what? Yeah. Um, I would say our team would not have been able to create something like Flappy Bird, even if we had wanted to. Oh, jeez. Um, and I, I'm not saying this is this is bad or good. It's, it's it's just a matter of what you're passionate about. What do you? What kind of games do you want to have? And of course, at least for us, this is the case. Um, if somebody writes the stuff that we do, be it uh, um, in terms of Galaxy Fire or now with Everspace. Hey guys, we love what you do, and um, I buy that game, although it's not finished yet. Uh, that, that, this this reward is so much worth, and um, this is why you put so much time and effort into this. Um, that's why we love what we do, and I think it shows in the products that we create. And if you do something for for a quick buck, it also shows in the product. And there are certain um, people who, who would buy the things with a lot of passion, and there are others who say, well, that's just something nice and little, and I just uh, take it as a snack, I'm fine, I go. And it, I, I buy it because everybody buys, buys it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just, I, I guess yeah, it's, not, it's not that there are less, kind of like in, in flight sims, right? Because Brian and I were, were big on flight sims you know, back, back when they were, actually existed. And, <laughs> you know, but and well, in space games too, you know, and, and that, and and thank God, space games are back, right? Because we went through a, a long period where there was just no such thing as a space game, and you know, so now it's come back into vogue, thankfully. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's it's just the um, I don't, back whenever flight sims were a thing, I don't think there are any less people that are interested in it now. It's just that whenever whenever big business looks at the at the chart right and they say well there's there's a lot more gamers now but the per, but the number of gamers that like this genre are about the same as there were but if you look at at like all the all the simple little quick games there's a lot of audience for that that just didn't exist before right so so i don't i don't think that either genre has actually lost fan base but it's it just doesn't look as big in in uh, comparison with what's out there in that freemium space, which makes yeah. it weird, yeah. you know. And and it's if you're looking like from an, from an investor, it's kind of oh, what's that? Oh, that's that? I don't know what that was. I don't know. It's there's been weird static in Skype the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, kind I'm of, still here. I can hear you loud and clear. All good. Okay. But but anyway, no, it's that's just my observation. Is is not like you know the the people that like that kind of thing never went away. It's just that there's another audience that came in. Yeah. Exactly, that's that's the opposite. So the the cool thing is if you have a game that existed genre-wise back in the days, let's say, goes back even to the 80s, 
you still can connect to those guys, but there, we were only a few. I mean, if you had a C64 in the 80s, you were one of the few back in class, at least that it was in my case. And now everybody is playing mobile uh, games or PC games. At Gamescom, if you see 350,000 people had been to Gamescom in Cologne last week, and you see everybody. Uh, you see girls, boys, any, any kind of age, uh, different types of people there in whatever genre. It's crazy. They, they dress up at cos cosplay. And you're among that and say, well, this is great. When I started playing games, I was one of the geeks in, uh, back in school. And now um, my partner, he has three kids, son of 10 and two girls, uh, um, eight years old, twins. And they all play games. For them, it's normal, right? Like reading a book. So it's not the gamer anymore. So you, you used to be gamers. And I think this, that it doesn't true, it's not true anymore that somebody is a gamer or not because everybody plays if you're younger, right? So, oh, yeah, definitely. So the, the market is just much bigger now. And um, so with space games, um, I know that, that kids who are like 12 or 14, they're super excited about Everspace because they, they see all the graphics and stuff. And uh, maybe they're not so crazy about the story that we're putting in there, but they, they see, the, see the action and so on. And if you're a little bit older, you appreciate what we have in terms of storyline there and um, still like the, the action and everything. So right. it hasn't been a better time to make games than these days. It, yeah. it, we really are, I think, in another golden age of PC gaming because it's just there's so much good stuff out there. And like you said, the tools to make good stuff are more accessible than ever before. Well, maybe maybe we should look at at the mobile gaming as a gateway drug. You know, it's like it's like we we get them we get them playing stuff because they've got a phone in their pocket, right? So it, it's not like they have to go out and invest in a in a Nintendo DS or right, whatever. Right. It's like no, you already have this thing. So so you know, play our game and then oh yeah, come over to the PC where we where we really do this. You know? Yeah, we we have we have so, backers we have backers for Everspace that. I played Galaxy and Fire on my feature phone, one and two. I played one and two on iOS. I got the PC version, and now I want to have a space on any platform it comes out. I mean, those, had, those are fans that had been with us for almost 10 years. We have our best Russian guy back, back in the days. We had a Russian guy who was a super fan of Galaxy and Fire, translated everything. It was a very good uh, localization because he was a fan. He really knew the game inside out. And he's now, he reached out to us, can I do the Russian, Russian local, localization for Everspace and do the community stuff? And we're like, yes, of course. I mean, it's somebody who's, who's with us now for, for seven years. The same with, with the Polish guy. And um, last week, a guy from Brazil said, well, I love to do the Portuguese uh, version for, for Brazil for free because simply I love that game. And you're like, how cool is that? Right. Yeah, it's, it's just such a great time to not only be a gamer, but probably a game developer. Yeah, well, <laughs> since, since you're talking about the international stuff, um, question about that. So whenever I look at Steam, on the numbers, right? I, I see that uh, primarily. Well, there's a lot of a lot of people that are customers in America, and then the second largest population on Steam is Russians, mm -hmm. and yep. yet I don't see a lot of games that are. Well, there's a lot of games that are that are developed in Russia and then localized over here, and some of them you wouldn't even know. Um, but um, it's like I don't see a lot of games that actually target that market too much that come from America that way which but is, i see a lot of games is, come from them to us yeah yeah which is a i think it's a huge opportunity um uh, that that uh, that is missed here so when we added the russian translation for and really pro it's not translation really a, a passionate localization for for galaxy fire the downloads really peaked and um mm. Uh, Russia was num our, the number four market for us on iOS um, back in the days with, with Fish Labs, simply because we had the Russian localization and because there are so many of them. They By the time, they had a lot of iOS. And um, I know a lot of people are concerned about piracy in Russia. I just can say if you take the market seriously, if you have day one Russian translation, they really appreciate it. I think it's one of the greatest markets out there. They buy the stuff. They do anything for you. They're super vocal on the forums. Make sure you get your Russian fans on board, and which is why we have our Kickstarter campaign translated in Russian. Hmm. Oh, really? Yeah, so that, that definitely makes sense. So uh, hint, hint to all other developers that may listen. <laughs> Russian on yeah. day one. 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So uh, it's well. What about um, in the Europe market? Is is Germany pretty much the the big consumer in games? Because um, I know like board games and stuff. You guys see? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, board games, it's adventure games. Uh, so Tim Schafer has a, had a nice plug in his Kickstarter campaign, so adventure games are dying out, just not in Germany. And so that, was, um, that is true to a certain extent, but it's also shooters, racing games and such. So Germany is the biggest market in Europe, um, but uh, UK is pretty close to that. It used to be the other way around, but now Germany is, is the largest market. Um, sadly, um, there are not too many great games coming out of Germany. So it's, uh, it's a combination of... The Germans tend to create, the German developers tend to ga make games that are very deep in terms of strategy and so on, and not, not too many action games. A few exceptions would be, uh, well, obviously Crytek, and then I uh, don't know if you came across Lords of the Fallen from Deck 13. Yeah. They just won oh, um, yeah. best, best studio in Germany, well deserved. Great, fantastic uh, title, great team, very, very nice guys. Oh, wow. They've been around for 15 years or so. Um, so if you haven't seen that, definitely worth checking out. Um, and then obviously Germany is, um, the, the German studios are good at free to play, uh, coming from browser games, because um, there was, a, it was kind of underserved, so when it took off, because we had a good internet uh, infrastructure and um, how to say, database programming skills here, so free to play took off. So this is why mm -hmm. Big Point, Inno Games, Good Games, um, Gameforge in the very beginning, so they're they're all huge. They're all a couple hundred people. So and I know Good Games is or wants to become uh, a studio of 1,200 people. So uh, that's that's massive. And um, and now they're they're pretty successful on mobile too. So they're, they're doing pretty well. So but it's a yeah, it's a good, different kind of game. Yeah. Because yeah, the 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 first time that I remember encountering like you know just the the German gaming community. Was um, with uh, the Das Schwarze Auge. Das Schwarze um, Auge. <laughs> yeah, <Close. laughs> I'm, I'm mispronouncing close. Yeah, so so but the, uh, over here it was called um, Realms of Arcania. So we had Realms of Arcania ah, right. and then Star okay. Trail and mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's and it was just like wow, these guys make a better Dungeons and Dragons than we do. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> well, if you say. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was uh, it, the one thing that I that I had uh, noted from that though is those games were just brutally hard <laughs> you know they were they didn't take it easy on you at all so um, <laughs> it's uh, it, there, there seems to be a, um, a better appreciation of difficulty than, yeah and, 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 and we love that. simulations the Germans love simulation games so we have that's what a, someone just said in the chat that's what someone just uh, said in the Twitch yeah chat. yeah so in Germany there's um, I forgot, an, I forgot the name. You can have your machines that you use on on the field, like if you get out the potatoes and stuff. So you can, big. <laughs> what's, what's the name of it? I, I forgot that. Like this machinery um, in farming, agriculture. Like, uh, yeah, farming, far, farming yeah. machinery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some hardcore farming, right? What? <laughs> so you buy, oh my you God! Drive did, these did, huge did, machines and and get did, that, and it's uh, super successful. Have you seen the? Okay, so we have accessories, right? Like. Uh, um, you know, if if you want to play a racing game, you you know you get a nice race wheel with force feedback and and whatever. So then I saw uh, where Mad Cats is making a farming controller for <laughs> that actually yeah, like, screws down <laughs> onto your desk, and it's the little joystick and the buttons from a combine. And I mm -hmm. was just like, wow, okay, this is a lot more popular than I thought that it was because yeah, you know, let me put that in the in the in the thing for you because that's yeah that I that's amazing. That they're making that. <laughs> so, so I can just see, you know, somebody with an Oculus Rift on and a and a farm joystick on there. <laughs> Let me tell you something though about Farming Simulator though. Like that game is relaxing. I'm sure it is. I am. I am sure it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah Farming keep, si yeah, yeah, farm sim Simulator. That it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I keep waiting on them to put in like huh? a zombie cow mod, and then. <laughs> I'll, Cause, uh, cause you have to combine over the cows. Right? <laughs> so. Well, guys, okay. I oh sorry. No, go Let's ahead. do one more because I got to wrap up and go to work. So do one more. You were gonna do a question. So do your one more question, and then I'm. Oh okay, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything. Really oh, okay. Just... Yeah, I'm sorry. I got. We should wrap it up because I I do have to go to work. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's only one yeah. hour and forty minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the well, the German developers. Um, do you guys are you guys pretty tight? Do you know each other? Pretty well, um, or yeah, are you yeah, spread actually, out actually and kind of isolated? Okay. Mm, no, this the scene is, is not too large. Um, there's there's one conference, Kovadis, that's in, in Berlin, and about four thousand people are attending. But um, the last two years, um, every every talk was in English. That helped uh, tremendously to get international speakers, of course, um, but also to get this conference on the radar. Mm. So in case uh, you want to come to Berlin in April, the weather starts to be nice. Um, that is definitely something worth checking out. Uh, really great talks. People like uh, Ed Fries are coming, um, and uh, really some some top tier um, speakers. And uh, it's about everything. It's about console, PC, free to play, uh, whatever. And um, we'll see if in, it was the '90s. I could get a press junket to come over. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Doesn't happen anymore. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, so that, that that's kind of neat because uh, you know we talked to uh, David Morenz, uh, who's doing Starship Corporation. We got just various German developers that that have come on. So I just mm. didn't know, you know, if if you guys all hung out together or, or what, because it's you know it's a it's not a a big country, but it's not real small no. either. So you know, it's it's a lot more local than here because we got you know three thousand miles coast to coast. So yeah, and I know. Brian and I are yeah, that you, far apart. Yeah, you uh, guys are huge. Yeah. <laughs> I can <laughs> tell every time I come over. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty massive place. Uh, so, so I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, sorry, just a quick question. So was this your first Gamescom that you went to personally? No, no, no. I've been to came Gamescom till till it exists. Um, so I think it's the sixth year. Prior to that, we went to Leipzig, which was the games uh, convention. So the first time uh, was like 2005. It was like for three years in Leipzig, and then it was Gamescom. Oh. Nice. I would love to go to Gamescom because it's huge. Like I've seen yeah. videos, like massive. It's crazy, but you're gonna love it. <laughs> yeah, it's, we've been to E3 and it, and it's just like we look at Gamescom and it's like that's far more attractive. You know, it just it just seems like a saner event. It seems so. yeah, it seems more games focused <laughs> than. Uh... It is. It is. It's, it's a different show, so it's kind of unfair, I'd say, to compare them. So E3 is more uh, more about business, and you see more business people there. It's still huge, and you do have some consumers. Sure. And at Gamescom, you have kind of both. You have something like E3 that's a little bit more locked down, you don't, so that you won't have the consumers running around. And then there are these massive consumer halls with uh, the, the big booths of, of the EAs, Activisions, whatnot, and Xbox, and Sony, and it's crazy and something i haven't seen um at e3 is like this whole cosplay scene seems to go to gamescom so i'd say mm. 10 10 percent at least maybe 20 percent they are dressed up uh, as their favorite characters and they go they go crazy with their stuff and it's it's so great to see like those characters from all those games uh, as cosplay characters running around um it's fantastic it's because it shows the um, the affection of the fans to the to to games to to their passion. So that's yeah. That's I've started great. wondering about the cosplay thing. If some of the if some of the characters in the games are just the developers daring somebody to dress up like that. So. Oh no! You see them. You see you see them, and you can, you can tell that is not a developer. That those are fans. No, but I'm this... I'm saying maybe they put a character in there that's you know like ah, okay, like just... Mad Moxie in, uh, okay. in Borderlands. It's like well she's just there because we knew Jessica Negri was going to dress up like that. So. <laughs> we... Possibly, but you you see anything? Literally, people came as zombies, uh, Assassin's Creed uh, from Nintendo titles. Somebody came as a mushroom, and you're like, what? <laughs> Um, it's fantastic to see that. It's like Carnival. You know, you know what Carnival is? Yeah, in Brazil. Yeah. Crazy uh, yeah, but we have it in Germany in a crazy style. So oh. everybody dresses up stupidly and or fun, and um, so that's pretty much mixed with games. And you see that it's fantastic to see. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> great. <laughs> All right. So last question: When do you think this might come out, Everspace? When? When? October 2016. That's you it. need to be precise. If you're on Kickstarter, you need to give the month. No, new, new quarter. Not, not just a year. You oh. have to say the months. That seems reasonable. It's about yeah. two years. So yeah. Yeah. that seems a way off. And it sounds like no, Earl... it's, no, it's just a year. A year and a couple months. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but, but you started working on it earlier this year, is what I'm saying. So that's about two years. Oh yeah of development uh so that sounds that's pretty great because i'm i'm really excited to play this i want to play it right now but i'll wait 
<laughs> yeah, well, I, I hate it when they when people. Okay, case in point is um, when uh, CD Projekt Red announced the whole uh, Cyberpunk 2020 thing, which I've I've been a fan of the Cyberpunk 2020 stuff since you know the 90s, right? Yeah. So it's like, oh god, they're gonna make that, I, you know, great. And then and then it's like, oh yeah, well, you know, one of these years we'll get around to it. And it's like, oh god, why did you even tease me with it? You know, <laughs> I would <laughs> prefer to not even yeah. know. Yeah. So. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us uh, in the midst of your Kickstarter campaign and making the game. You must be super busy, but I want to thank sure you for thing. taking the the time to talk to us. It has been a pleasure, and uh, I think I can speak for all of us when I say we are super excited to actually play this thing. Uh, yes. This is so, so great to hear. And, uh, well, thank you guys for one hour 45 podcast. That's, that's oh, it's, 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 it's a, oh, no, it's a pleasure. We love getting into the nitty gritty. We, 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 and we don't mind talking for a while. So we, we, okay. we, we love it. So thank you so much for being willing to talk that long. Yeah. So honestly, thanks. if we could just have everybody over for dinner, we would do that. Oh God. For hours, <laughs> of, okay. for hours, a just have a huge, time. huge dinner party. Just talk for hours to everyone. As much food as you want. We make it a buffet. It'd be great. Be careful what you wish for. I might come. Oh, oh well, we would invite you. Uh, we, we'd make we'd make a big American buffet with lots of fatty food. That's how we yeah, would do right. it. You pick All which right. coast you're coming to, and one of us will get a plane ticket. Yeah, it, probably the <laughs> East Coast, since I'm outvoted. No, two to yeah, one. Well, we're looking. For, oh yeah, because Hunter's here. All right. Well, that's it. North Carolina by default. All of yeah. But Space yeah, Game majority, majority rule, majority rule. Space yeah. Game Junkie Com, North Carolina, 2017. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first. <laughs> well, Hunter's Hunter's from up in Ohio, where I grew up, and okay. then I'm about 600 miles south of that now. And then, uh, so he just moved down here. So he's he's not too far, a couple hours away from me. Right. Well, although, well, I guess I, you you all come to GDC, way. right? Yeah. Well, the what was neat, Brian and I have done this for years, but and we've known each other since God, what the nineties, yeah, and have had never actually met. And then he had a, a Matrix Games thing where they were doing a, sh a show up toward uh, Washington D.C., yeah, which Virginia. is about three hours north of me in Virginia. Yeah. And and it was just like, well, you're going to be there, so we drove up, you know, to. to that was my great. Wife and I drove up to meet Brian. Yeah, that, that was, was a good great. time. I wish I could have spent a, another. I, I should have, in hindsight. You should, should have taken that next day vacation. off because that, yes. that convention we went to was just fun. Just, yeah, it was I, fun I, I, watching I, people play these, this crazy ass board game shit. Yeah, well, and that's that's another thing, speaking of, of, of Germany and such, right? Because you guys are really into the board game scene there, right? And uh, w what about like tabletop miniatures and, and like the historical. Oh, that's big over here. Yeah. Um, definitely. It's uh, we still love that people meet up and uh, to do the the classic board games and and tabletop. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Big scene. God, I, I love that stuff. Yeah, I, I wish we had more of it here. It's uh, you know, it's it's pretty big. I mean, you see these kickstarters for board games just going off the chain. You know, so oh, I know, but it's is... like I own a bunch of board games. I don't have anybody to play with because they well, live far here. away. <laughs> that's because so. that's because it's so spread out. That's the thing. Well, that, that's the thing. Is like we need a smaller country. Like, like when I yeah, used to live I back should... east, it was much easier to find people to do pen and paper role playing stuff with, but out here it's like nigh impossible, you know, because it's so spread out in Los Angeles. So yeah, it's, it's next tough. year Gamescom, you come over and then I would love to come to Gamescom. <laughs> I should save up for that. I would love to come to. I, I I've been you know I see the shit coming out of Gamescom. I've been watching it for years. It's like I want to go to that. Yeah, I'd love to go to Germany too. So. uh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid if I leave the country, they won't let me back in. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? All right. All right. Well, folks, thank you so much for watching and listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Michael, thank you so much again for joining us. We are out. Thank you so much again, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.